Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Thursday night uh, in the Word. And we are just thankful to be here, to be with you, and to uh, sit down with uh, all of us and to share a little bit about um, God's Word. We've been talking about the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ that's found in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Um, that scripture says, Therefore, leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are the foundational milk, if you would, of God's word, those things that each one of us as believers need to have in our lives so that we can have a good solid foundation of our beliefs and, and how we see God and how we walk out things. Understanding of these things are principles that keep us from going astray. What does repentance truly mean? Repentance from dead works. What does faith toward God really mean? What does the doctrine of baptisms, plural? really mean. And so we've been talking about some of those things, even though we didn't start from the beginning on the broadcast, we started with faith um, because we all know at the time in which we started this, man, did we ever need to have our faith arise. And so we started with faith, but we've kind of settled in. We've gone through faith, um, the importance of faith, how that faith is not by sight, um, but our, our faith is by things unseen more than they are the things that are seen. We trust God and we believe God that we can walk by faith and not by that sight, trusting him that all things are possible. Understanding that our faith has to be directed toward God. This, this word of God moves us toward God. Um, faith is toward God not things or circumstances or people. And so we've been discussing faith, and I just think that there's been a real attack on our faith. There's been a real onslaught by the enemy. You know, I'm preaching on Sundays, or have been preaching on Sundays, about the signs and the seasons that we're living in. Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about um, the things that are going to happen. He talked about deception. He talks about uh, wars and rumors of wars. He talks about kingdom against kingdom, the powers of darkness coming against the powers of light. He talks about how we're going to be persecuted. And, and then he talks about the man of sin that will arise uh, and the spirit of lawlessness. Well, if there was ever a day and time when we needed to have faith, it is today. We need to have faith. And it's important that we have a good, solid foundation in our lives in God's word because we know that, that Jesus Christ is our rock. That foundation can be unshakable if we have a solid understanding of God's word and what God is speaking to us. And so when we have that, the weapon of our warfare is not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what do we use? We use the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. We use the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Hell of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, the, the uh, belt of truth. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We, we have all those things, weapons to use in order that we might walk out this uh, life with God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So these doctrines, these um, truths are important for us that you and I have a good, solid foundation to build our relationship on Christ. The Bible says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and so on and so forth. For what purpose? He said, because if you're faithful doing these things, adding to your faith, you will not stumble or you will not fall. It's a progression. It's a moving forward. But yet it is a faith walk. And as we have that solid foundation laid, then we can add to that foundation solid things, the doctrines of Christ, the word of God, the things of God, theologies, um, everyday 
things that we learn about God's Word. We can talk about predestination. We can talk about different subjects that are deeper, more weightier things that are meat and not waver um, as we study and as we look at those things. Another important thing about knowing what uh, the Word of God teaches us is if you back up some from Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, you back up to Hebrews 5, 12, it says that we ought to be teachers, that when we ought to be teachers, we have need again for somebody to teach us the very elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ because meat belongs to the mature. When we ought to be teachers, we have somebody needful to teach us again because um, we are yet babes in Christ. In other words, we did not digest the milk and feed ourselves properly, and so we're not on a good foundation, and so we are not able to discern um, good from evil. And I believe that's where we're at today, and he's not talking about good for evil by talking about is it right or wrong to murder, do we need to discern about drunkenness? Do we need to discern about drug addiction? Do we need to discern about adultery? Do we need to discern about fornication? Do we need to discern about lying? It's not talk, he's not talking about those type of things. He's really, he, I, I believe in my heart of hearts that he's talking about circumstances and situations that we see and face today. Can we discern through the power of the Holy Spirit in faith what's going on in our world today? Good and evil. What's good? What's evil? Because I'm going to tell you, the devil disguises himself. The Bible explicitly tells us that Satan comes in sheep's clothing. He and he really is a wolf. You have to have discernment to know the difference. And it's not talking about discernment to know um, that we fail, we fall short, that we're not perfect. All of us know that already. We already know we're not perfect. Now, if you're a human being on the face of this planet that's been around any time at all, you're not sitting around wondering, am I perfect? You know you're not perfect. You know you haven't arrived yet. You know that you fail and fall short and got all kinds of things that you wrestle with. You know that when you go to do good, evil's present. Things I would do, I find myself not doing. Things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. What is the answer, God? What is going to be the thing that's going to help me through this to get to where I am needed to get to with you, and that is Jesus Christ, he says. So we're, our faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and God calls us then, because of that faith in what Jesus did, to enter into his rest. I have ceased from my own labors. In other words, I can't make myself righteous. I cannot make myself holy. So I enter into his rest, my faith, my trust, my confidence is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I can rest in that knowing that it is in him that I live and breathe and have my being. Not what I do. Not what you do. It's in Christ. And my trust and my faith is in him. Not only my faith and trust in, is in him that he has saved me, but my faith and trust is in him that he can also keep me. Trusting God with all of our hearts, minds, and soul and strength. So I want to finish up our stuff on faith with a, a little bit of a supplementary on faith here. And, and I want to read some things, but to share some stuff to us. But I, I just want to say that this is an hour when God is not only restoring apostolic ministry, but also apostolic doctrine. The Apostle Paul, who fought the good fight of faith, warned Timothy that in the last days, some would depart from the faith. If we would also fight the good fight of faith, we too must hold fast to the teachings of the holy apostles. You know, the Bible tells us in Acts 16, uh, 4 through 5, he says, As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered um, to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. About over, And what did they do? were they strengthened by? They were strengthened by faith by what they were eating, and they were eating the apostles' doctrine. It's the same thing in Acts there where it talks about in Acts chapter 2, and they went uh, uh, to the temple and from house to house daily, breaking bread and fellowshipping over the apostles' doctrine or the doctrine of Christ. 
it, it's important for us to know. That. And it says in Acts 16, 4, it says the, that the decrees that were ordained by the apostles were delivered to the churches. And this resulted, this, this eating, this uh, my faith is by the word of God, by hearing and hearing the word of God, their faith was strengthened and established because of what was being delivered to them. They didn't have this 66 book sitting before them. But man, what they had, they devoured, they loved, they ate it, they, they desired it, and the word of God was sanctifying them. The word of truth was purifying them. And their faith was being established. Their faith was being developed day by day so that they were doing the works of God through faith in what God's word was telling them. From the time of the inception of the church unto this day, those who have served or swerved from faith have tried to shipwreck the faith of others. Have you noticed that when somebody goes off track, when somebody's faith wavers or they, or they move from the, 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 the path of trusting God or their eyes are off Jesus, they never hardly ever go off just on their own, but they try to take others with them. They, they're not content with being shipwrecked themselves. They tried to shipwreck the faith of others. And we are living in a time when many lukewarm people who call themselves Christians are using their measure of faith they have received from God to preserve, pursue a pleasing of self rather than God. When we view such a use of faith in light of God's intended purpose in creation, we see that in many Christians in this hour, that in, that in, that in, that in reality, this is a usurping of the role of, create, of, of the creator by the creature. The faith walk of so many Christians in this hour would seem to indicate that God exists for their pleasure rather than them for his. God is not existing for our pleasure. We were created for his pleasure. Revelations 4.11 declares who the creator is and for what purpose all things were created when he says, for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It's not about our pleasure. It's about us being pleasing to God. During these last days, much of God's given faith, much of the God-given faith is being used to pursue by spiritual means the things we used to lust after before we professed Christ. Such a use of faith is an abomination to God. I believe God is moving by His Spirit to receive the God-intended use of the measure of faith. The first principles of the teachings of Christ depicted in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 um, would, would um, seem to indicate that faith is for the purpose of moving toward God. Faith is for the purpose of moving toward God. Doctrine of um, faith is faith toward God, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 says. I am convinced that there is a fresh move of the Holy Spirit to, re to restore an emphasis of faith toward God and not a faith toward self. Much of the past, faith teaching, has produced a host of faith talkers who testify of many blessings in their lives and, have, and, have, and that have manifested by faith. They measure the greatness of their faith by the abundance of things they possess through their believing. Shouldn't God's presence, though, and not God's presence be the measuring stick? Let me, let, me, let me speak that again. They measure the greatness of their faith by the abundance of things they possess through their believing. Shouldn't God's presence and not God's presence be the measuring stick? Not how much I have, but what and how much of God's presence is evident in my life. I'd rather be a pauper in this life, but walk in the power and presence of God's Spirit. My, the size of my home, my vehicles, my toys are not measures of my success or of the success of my faith, but 
more so the presence of God that is in my life. I don't know about you, but I want my faith to be used to come to God for God towardness so that I can walk under an open heaven that is proven out in my life by God's presence, not things. God's not against us having things. But I shouldn't seek the Jesus of things. I should seek the Jesus who wants to live and abide in my life. The ability to believe for his presence rather than his presence used it used to be the benchmark of spirituality by many in the charismatic Pentecostal movement. This spiritual cancer has infected many within the church today and has caused them to pursue the idols of covetousness and greed. Some of the idols they are coveting include such things as spiritual gifts, believe it or not, healings, miracles, salvation of loved ones, cars, homes, and all manner of prosperity. Some of these things in and of themselves is not wrong. Consequently, they measure the fruitfulness of their faith by the abundance of God's presence. They possess rather than God's presence. This is clearly a misuse and abuse of the faith that God has entrusted to our care. I want to speak to us Christians. Though God has promised those things and more, he is not pleased to see his people holding fast to all the promises while at the same time letting go of the promiser. I know that's a mouthful. But I believe, I believe in all my heart that all of us in some form or fashion have has left our first love. But thanks be to God by his presence and his Holy Spirit, by faith he's calling us back to our first love, our primary love the purpose of our life, that our faith would be directed toward him, that our eyes would be on him, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. These are like those referred to in 1 Timothy 6.3. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. God's not wanting us to teach things contrary to the things of God. What do they do? These people promise, 1 Timothy 6, 3 is talking about people who promise that gain is godliness. Gain is godliness. God commands us to withdraw ourselves from these and follow those who believe that godliness with contentment is great gain. The Greek word translated as godliness here means a well or strong devotion characterized by a Godward attitude for the purpose of pleasing him or simply stated a God towardness. A God towardness. Because that's what we should be after. Amen? That's what we should be after. Paul admonishes us to exercise. And, and by the way, who was Paul talking to? He was not talking to seasoned veterans. He was talking to a young minister named Timothy. Why? Because he wanted Timothy to have the same solid foundation that his mother had and that his grandmother had. That same faith that was passed down to him from generations that caused Timothy to be established on the rock. He did not want Timothy to waver or to be someone in his youth who misused or abused his faith who would lead people down a wrong path. But he wanted Timothy to make sure that he prepared himself by studying God's word and having a faith that was God towardness. Paul admonishes us to exercise ourselves unto godliness or God towardness because it is profitable unto all things in this life and in the life to come. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says this, But refuse profane and old wives' tables, fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is 
and of that which is to come. God's promises, first and foremost, is for the life hereafter, but also for this life. He tells us in Matthew 6, 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to us. But come on, let's be honest. Uh, we direct our, our, our role or our responsibilities, things toward God, our faith even, toward this life in order that we might be successful and that we might prosper, but yet the Bible teaches us that how I'm supposed to prosper is even as my soul prospers. So the first and foremost thing that I am to give attention to is not working 50, 60 hours a week so that I can get more ahead than where I'm at right now. It is about seeking his kingdom first. And he says, when I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all of these other things will be added to me. That's why Paul says, in all things I have learned where to be content, whether I abound or whether I am abased. I have learned therewith where to be content. Why? Because his faith was directed toward God, who he knew God would supply all of his needs according to his riches and glory, even though he suffered much hardship. To use faith to lay hold of God and to come into his presence for the purpose of pleasing him will draw down great graces from God. Hebrews 11.1, 1, what does it say? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, depicts faith as an unseen substance, but nevertheless real. This substance is like a heavenly currency, which can be used to obtain, obtain, obtain things that we need and desire in both the spiritual and the natural realms. It would be sad in the end of times to realize that I have spent all of the substance to enhance my life in the natural kingdom of which I am no longer a citizen. The kingdom that God has summoned us to seek first and lay up treasures in is a heavenly or a spiritual kingdom. One can lay up treasure in the natural kingdom by both natural means and wisdom or by faith. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on, on the right hand of God and set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Christ is currently seated with his father rather than, and, and, and we, are to, we are to seek after those things where Christ is seated rather on the things of the earth. Ephesians 1, 3 reinforces this by saying, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. The apostle John said that we, are, we, are, we who are born of God will overcome the world and that um, the means to accomplish that victory will be our faith. What a sad commentary it would be if the substance Jesus provided to lay hold of that victory over the world would instead be used to entrench us more in it. I, I truly believe that that's the reason. When I talk to people, Christians, about we are, we, we are, you know, the scripture tells us, in the scripture there it talks about, as we look at lawlessness, he tells us, brethren, we are in the last hour. This is all the way back as scripture is dealing in Matthew, we are in the last hour. Well, if we were in the last, if they were in the last hour, we're in the last minute. And when I talk to people about that, it's, it's as though they are, they get down in the, in, in, in the dumps. They, they're almost depressed. They don't want to talk about that, that we might be in the last minute, that, that we may be entering into a time when the coming of the Lord Jesus is nigh, when he catches away the five wise virgins out of this world. It's, it's almost like their world is shattered. And the reason for that is, is because we have used our walk with God to entrench us into this world that causes us a heartache to think that we might leave this place. Oh my goodness. How did we ever come to such a place as this? Stop. I'm not talking about us not working a job. I'm not talking about us being a good employee. I'm not talking about us having a car, a house, or a boat, or toys, or this, that, or the other. 
But when these things become so much to us that we can't stand the thoughts of leaving this life, in order that we might for eternity dwell in the presence of a mighty God, brothers and sisters, we are entrenched in this world and in this kingdom. This is not our home. We're just passing through. We're sojourners, ambassadors of Christ in really a foreign country. Really, we're in a foreign country. My, my, my culture is not to be a Brazilian culture or European culture or not even an American culture. My culture, my allegiance is to a kingdom culture. It doesn't mean that I disrespect anybody else that's out here. I, it doesn't mean that I throw rocks at somebody's um, idea or where they live or who they are or their heritage. It's just that I'm not a part of this uh, world in that measure anymore. I am a part of a kingdom culture, and the kingdom culture is what we should be bringing to bear on the culture that we live in, not the opposite. The opposite has been put upon the church, and the church has walked in it to a place to where we now look more like the world than we do the kingdom of God. Can the world tell the difference in us because of our faith? Hey, I, I'm in the same boat. I'm sitting here right now, convicted, heartbroken, because I'm not more of a light. I'm not more of a witness. I'm not more of a testimony. But the, the answer is waking up to it and stop going along with the flow and rise up in the name of Jesus in faith to believe that God is calling us out of the muck and the mire that we're living in to get our eyes back on Jesus and walk in his presence to do his will and his bidding in this world. Let faith arise and our enemies be scattered. Is that, are those just words to us? Is living a godly life in God's presence through the spirit and power of Jesus Christ just cliche? Is letting people around us know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? It's coming. It's going to happen. Maybe I'll see it. Maybe I won't. But I can tell you this much. It's closer now than we have ever experienced it to be. And the only thing that's going to keep us in the times that we are living in is faith in God. Faith toward God. I was going to move on into the doctrine of baptisms, but I just feel like this is a good place um, for us to stop tonight. And uh, I, I, I hope that you hear my heart, you hear through what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to put us down. I'm not trying to bury us. I, I, I think that we are living in the greatest opportunity that we could ever live in. We have We have more opportunity right now for the church to rise and shine that people would see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. This is an hour for the church to be the church. I don't believe people are rejecting Jesus Christ. I believe they're rejecting a church that has lost their way. A church that has left him standing at the door. A church that's not listening as Jesus knocks a church that for whatever reason, it's simple, really. He says it's so simple that a child could understand it. But a church that has lost their way of their salvation, their joy of their salvation is not there. We can take church or we can leave it. We can take Jesus or we can leave We would admit it, but we do it by our actions every single day. All of us. Let's reverse course. Let's repent. 
Let's repent of our sins. Let's turn away from that that we've been following. And let us look to the one who's able to change us. What would Jesus do? I, I love that song that says, what would you do if Jesus walked into the room? What would we do if Jesus literally, physically walked into our church on Sunday? I would dare to say, I would dare to say that we wouldn't recognize him. This is an hour for us to rise up, to not just with our mouths say what we are. This is an hour for us to rise up and be what we need to be. God bless you today. I want to pray with us. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your presence, your power, the glory of your presence, the spirit of God that we can sense and feel in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you did not go off and leave us abandoned, but you gave us all the tools that we need to live victoriously in this life. Help us to become students of the word. Help us to fix our eyes on you, Lord to direct our hearts and lives toward you. Let our faith arise, God. Let us begin to um, seek you out that we would have a good, solid, firm foundation that no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what storms of life may come, when all of that settles down, God, we're still standing on the rock in Christ Jesus. Touch each person's life, God, that's listening to them. Help them, strengthen them, convict us with your word. Draw us, Holy Spirit. And then give us the, give us the integrity, the boldness to repent and to look to you, our hope and our refuge. In Jesus' name, God bless you so much for being with us. And thank you again for being with us. See you next Thursday at 630.